We have been working through a study on the Holy Spirit, and uh, we're going to continue that. Remind you, this is the last Sunday of April, right? Next Sunday will be Communion Sunday. So just to have your hearts prepared uh, for that as we will um, observe the Lord's Supper next week. When we think of the Holy Spirit, we tend to think of the work of the Holy Spirit beginning in the book of Acts chapter 2 that we just read. Well, that really isn't correct. We've already observed in our study that the first time that we hear of the Holy Spirit is on the day of creation, the first day of creation, where the Holy Spirit moved on the face of the waters. But we also see him in other places in the Old Testament. Remember the days before the flood, God said that his spirit would no longer strive with men. And then God gave his spirit to men to enable them to do the specialized work of constructing the things that would be involved in the tabernacle. And then there are other times throughout the Old Testament days when the Holy Spirit came upon men for different things. David knew of the work of the Holy Spirit when he referred to him in Psalm 139. And he talked about not being able to get away from the Holy Spirit's presence, that the Holy Spirit was with him everywhere. So not only is the existence and work in the of the Holy Spirit and the lives of the Old Testament men was known, but God also promised in the Old Testament a future day when his Holy Spirit would be poured out in a way that was not seen before. Peter in his message on the day of Pentecost quoted one of those promises from God that's found in the book of Joel chapter 2 and verse 28 and 29. And he quotes this uh, passage and I'm reading it from the book of Joel. And it shall come to pass Afterward, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall see dreams, and so forth. It's interesting to observe here that the promise of God was that he would pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And then Peter went and quoted that in the book of Acts chapter 2, and so it's interesting that when Cornelius invited Peter to come and talk to him that Peter didn't think back and say well why not God said that he was going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh that would have to include the Gentiles but he had to be persuaded to go if you recall today I want us to consider the coming of the Holy Spirit as we find it in the New Testament now we've already talked a lot about the Holy Spirit and how Jesus promised his coming and so forth but today I want to look at Jesus final promise about the actual coming of the Holy Spirit and how he would be received and when now most of Jesus teaching about the Holy Spirit is found in the book of John but Luke records it as making this statement as one of the earliest teachings that he made on the subject in Luke chapter 11 verse 13 if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So the first thing that I want us to look at this morning is, do we ask God still today to give us the Holy Spirit? If not, how does it apply? So to answer the question, I want us to look at some truths that John records that Jesus said. For the sake of time this morning, I'm, um, I'm going to just go through these, and if you want to take and look them up, but you can, but I'm just going to read them. The first passage is in the book of John, chapter 7, verses 37 to 39. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. This he spake of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. There are two points that I want us to see here. First of all, who should receive the Holy Spirit? Jesus made it very clear that the ones who will receive the Holy Spirit is, are those who believe on him and that they will receive him. Now, 
we need to be mindful of that because there are people who would like to claim the Holy Spirit who have not believed on Jesus. And so we need to understand that everything that we teach about the Holy Spirit and is working in our lives is only for those who believe on Jesus. Secondly, what Jesus is saying here is that the Spirit was yet future in his time to be given. And it was not going to happen until after he was glorified. Now, Jesus was glorified in the resurrection. He was also glorified in his ascension when he went back to heaven. And so it was not going to be until after his resurrection and until after he was ascended that the Holy Spirit was going to come. So they had two things to look forward to, even though they did not know at that point in time what they were, that were going to happen before the Holy Spirit would come. Now, Jesus expanded further on how the Holy Spirit would be received, and we've looked at this one before, when Jesus promised that disciples that the Holy Spirit was going to come, but not only would he be with them, but he would be in them. And that is an important truth that we need to understand, that the Holy Spirit would not only dwell with them, but be in them. Now, that's different than what was experienced in the past. Now, there were a couple of men in the Old Testament that the, God said that they had the Holy Spirit from the time that they were born. But that wasn't the common practice. The Holy Spirit came upon these particular people to help them to do something, but he did not dwell in them permanently. So what Jesus is promising here is going to be different. The Holy Spirit is going to be permanently indwelling us. And as I understand it, he's going to be indwelling us forever. What a wonderful promise that is. Now, Paul's teaching agrees that the Holy Spirit will indwell each believer, as we see first in the book of Romans, chapter 8 and verse 9. But you are not in the Spirit, but in, excuse me, that's so wrong. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Now, we're going to come back to this passage here in a few messages uh, in the future so we're not going to look any more about that about being in the flesh or in the spirit but in that passage of scripture anyone who is not indwelt by the spirit of God is not a believer is not in Christ and so that's something that we want to be confident of that we have the Holy Spirit and that we are therefore in Christ 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16, Paul writes this, Know you not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Verse, uh, Galatians chapter 4 and verse 6, Because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So in these two verses... Paul is writing to believers. He's writing because they are believers and they are because they are sons or children of God, they have the Holy Spirit indwelling them whom God has sent. And that they are He is dwelling in them as the temple of God. Now, we can answer our question here as to whether or not we need to ask our Heavenly Father to give us the Holy Spirit today. Now, it's my understanding that we do not need to ask God to indwell us by His Spirit or to give us the Holy Spirit. It's certainly proper to ask that we be enabled by the Holy Spirit for power to do a particular task, such as I do each morning, each Sunday, before I preach. But because we have Him from the time that we are saved in dwelling us, we don't have to ask God to give Him to us because we already have Him. Now, one of the things to remember here, just in passing, is that Jesus in the the days of the uh, Gospels that we read there are still really living in the Old Testament times. And the, in the Old Testament times, the Holy Spirit was not indwelling people. So if you wanted the Holy Spirit, Jesus is saying you can ask God to give him to you. But because we have him indwelling, we don't need to ask him to give him to us. We need to ask him to enable us, to empower us to do his work. The second 
point that I want us to see here this morning is in John's prophecy where John said that he shall baptize you, referring to Jesus, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Now we've just summarized that Jesus promised about the coming of the Holy Spirit, but we find a prophecy about the coming of the Holy Spirit two years or so before Jesus made his promises about the coming of the, of the Comforter. The forerunner to Jesus, John the Baptist, made this prophecy about the one who was coming after him that is recorded in the first three Gospels. He made his prophecy even before Jesus himself was baptized by a water baptism and began his ministry when the Holy Spirit was seen descending on him like a dove. John the Baptist, we're only going to look at one of these verses, but in Mark chapter 1 and verses 7 and 8, John said this, I have indeed baptized you with water, but he, the one who's coming, that's going to follow him, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Now, John's statement implies that Jesus is not going to baptize with water, but we find here in a couple of different places, I'm only going to refer to one of them, in John chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, when therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. We're told here that Jesus baptized like John baptized. Is that a contradiction? Did John say it wrong? Well, in the next verse, in verse 2, we have a parenthetical thought that's written in there. Though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples. We could put it like this, and if we were talking about it today, we could say the Jesus Evangelistic Association was baptizing people. However, it was not Evangelist Jesus that was doing the baptizing, but his associates. So we could safely say that Jesus was not baptizing with water, just like John said, but that Jesus was going to be baptizing people with the Holy Spirit. That was a difference. Jesus was giving, getting credit for doing the baptizing, even though he was not the one doing it himself. Now, I've worked for a couple of construction companies doing carpentry work. And so I was the one that was swinging the hammer, sawing the wood or whatever. And, but you know what? I never saw a sign out there that said, this is the house that Gary Troster built. No, the company that I was working for got their name on the sign and they got the credit for my work, as well as the other carpenters that I worked with. And that's what Jesus was doing here. He was getting the credit for doing the baptizing even though he wasn't doing it himself. The third point that I want us to see this morning is Jesus' promise, you shall be baptized. Not many days hence, and that's in the passage that we read this morning in Acts chapter 1. What we're looking at here now is just before Jesus ascended into heaven. And we already read those verses, and so I'm not going to look at them and read them for you again right now, except to point out in verse 5, Acts chapter 1 and verse 5, Jesus is restating what John the Baptist, uh, John the Baptist said. And he says this, For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Now notice the difference between the things that John said and what Jesus said. John said, he shall baptize you at some point in the future. Jesus now is saying, and he's making a promise, you shall be baptized not many days hence. Now, there are many differences of understanding and there's a lot of confusion about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
And I'm not going to go and take the time and to talk about all the different ways that people have and they talk about the baptism, of the understanding that they have about the baptism of the Spirit. I don't think, think that would uh, accomplish anything for us this morning. I only intend to briefly summarize what I and others believe from the Scriptures and why. The first place that we need to look as the day of the fulfillment of Jesus' promise in Acts chapter 2 that we also read here a few moments ago. And when we look at Acts chapter 2, we find that the disciples were gathered together. They'd been in the upper room and they had been praying. And then all of a sudden there was a sound of a rushing mighty wind. And in verse 4 it says they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now notice here that it does not say that they were baptized. It says they were filled with the Holy Ghost. It's a totally different word. Now what this was was the fulfilling of the promise that Jesus had previously made that the coming of the Holy Spirit would indwell them. He would be in them. This was also the fulfilling of Jesus' promise that they would be baptized with the Spirit. And even following this event, though, the word baptized is never used. It is never used about the empowering of the disciples. Anytime that you read about the disciples needing to be empowered by the Holy Spirit, it always says they were filled, with one exception. In the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 12, and verse 13. Now, before I get there, the question that we might ask is, so did Jesus not know what he was talking about? Did Luke misunderstand what it was that Jesus was saying? And we quickly reply, of course not. Okay, so how do you explain the discrepancy between Jesus promising that they would be baptized and that they would be fit and they were instead filled? I believe the answer is in that verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. And Paul says this, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. As we have just seen, the time that Jesus was promising would the promise that he said was going to happen would happen on that day that we call the day of Pentecost. Now, I believe what happened that day was the beginning of the fulfillment of another promise, a prophecy or promise that Jesus had made to his disciples that he would build his church. Remember, he told Peter, I will build my church upon the declaration that you've just made about who I am. And that's found in the book of Matthew, chapter 16 and verse 18. Paul gives us an important detail about this church that Jesus promised that would be built in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 19 to 22, where he said this. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit." Now, that ties our thoughts together here. The Holy Spirit was to be the builder of the building. He was going to be the builder of this habitation of God, his temple, the church that Jesus said he would build. Now, what can get confusing is that the church is described by several word pictures in the New Testament. Here it is pictured as a household of God, as a building, the habitation of God, a temple. Elsewhere it's pictured as the body of Christ, and later as his wife or as his bride. But they're all picturing the same entity, the church, which we are a part of. We are part of this church, but we are also a part of the church universal, the church around the world that has been in existence since Jesus uh, left and went back to heaven and the Holy Spirit came. 
So in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, where Paul says that the believers are all baptized into one body is the same as saying they are all baptized into the church which the Holy Spirit began to build on the day of Pentecost. So we need to understand that this baptism here is not water baptism, that you got baptized if you made that choice to be baptized and the pastor took you down to wherever it is that you go here to get baptized and he dumped you under the water. That's not what we're talking about here. It's the same baptism or similar to the picture that Paul presents in the book of Ephesians chapter 6 verses 3 and 4. Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. The picture there is that we have been placed at salvation into Christ and we have been placed and identified with him and into his death. So baptism... In that case, we are buried with him. We've been raised up with him from the dead to the glory of the Father, even so that we should walk in newness of life. Baptism is being submersed into something. And the Holy Spirit takes us and he submerses us. He places us into Christ, into the, his body. And it's a, identifying us with him. So there's a word change that we should observe here. John and Jesus said that they would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. John baptized with the medium of water. Jesus <clears throat> was going to be baptized with the medium of the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians, we are baptized by one spirit. The word with and by are the same word in the Greek. So my understanding is that when we are baptized with the Holy Spirit, he comes and he indwells us at the very same moment that he comes and indwells us, he places us into the body of Christ. So we are baptized with the Holy Spirit who baptizes us into the church, the body. And that's where I understand here that we take this, that Jesus said you will be baptized with the Spirit. He is going to come, he is going to indwell you, and then he is going to place you into the body of Christ. So they were baptized, but at the same time filled with the Holy Spirit as he indwelt them. The first believers to be baptized into the body were the disciples in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, when they were initially filled and indwelled by the promised Holy Spirit of Jesus. We're going to be looking more about being filled with the Spirit in our next messages in this series. Now finally, I want us to see in point number four, Jesus' second promise about the coming of the Holy Spirit. I want us to go back to the book of Acts again, if you're still there, that's a good thing. Because there's a second promise there that I want us to look at that we did not read this morning, and I should have probably included it. But it's a very familiar verse in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. But you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Here's a promise. You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Wow, that sounds exciting. That sounds promising, doesn't it? I mean, we'll get a lot of power to do stuff. I mean, think about it. After Jesus was tempted, we read in, John, in Luke chapter 4 and verse 14, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame unto him throughout all the region round about. Now think about all the things that Jesus was able to do in the power of the Spirit. We read in Luke chapter 9 and verse 1, Jesus called his 12 disciples together, and he gave them power and authority over devils and to cure diseases. So Jesus went around doing all kinds of miracles. He, did, he raised people from the dead, and the disciples went, and they did all kinds of things. He gave them power. 
It's true that miraculous things were done by some of the early believers. In Acts 3, Peter and John <clears throat> healed a cripple who was unable to walk. And Peter said in Acts chapter 3 and verse 12, Men of Israel, why marvel you at this? Or why look you so earnestly on us? As though by our own power or holiness we have made this man to walk. He then went on and explained that they could only have accomplished that through the name of Jesus. Then we read about men like Stephen and Philip who were able to perform miracles and wonders. People were healed just by the shadow of Peter passing over them. And handkerchiefs were brought to Paul. And after he touched those handkerchiefs, the owners were healed. Peter and Paul both brought people back to life. So is that what Jesus was promising here? In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 when he says, You shall receive power that you will be able to do those things? <clears throat> It's certainly true those things that I just mentioned did happen after the Holy Spirit descended, but I want us to look a little more closely at that verse that we just read about this promised power. This promised power. Let's read it again. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses. Little words are very significant in the scripture. The and is very important here. You're going to receive power and you shall be witnesses. We usually think of this verse as a command, but it really is not a command. It is first a promise and then it is a statement of fact. First of all is the promise of power by the coming of the Holy Spirit. Then follows the statement of fact, what they will be and what they will do. They shall be witnesses declaring the truth about Jesus starting first in Jerusalem and eventually throughout the whole world. And we're still waiting to see that finalized. It's a lot further than it was in that day, but we're still waiting to see it through the whole world. So here is a promise that they will be supernaturally enabled, given power by the Holy Spirit to fulfill what he said they would do. Be witnesses. Now, if he had said it like this, they probably would have gotten really scared. If he had said, you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth, and then added... Oh yeah, and by the way, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. That would have been a little scary. You're going to be witnesses going into all the world, and then, oh, maybe the Holy Spirit's going to give us power. No, that's not what he promised. The first indication of the reality of that power happened immediately after the coming of the Holy Spirit that we read about in Acts chapter 2. Peter, who had just some 54 days or so before, had de totally denied that he ever knew Jesus, now gets up in front of thousands of people and he preaches a message of the gospel to which 3,000 people got saved. That's power to witness. Sometime later, after Peter and John had been threatened and warned not to speak anymore in the name of Jesus, the believers prayed for boldness. They needed power to be bold in their witness. And so they prayed and they asked for power, for boldness in the face of the threat. And we read in the book of Acts chapter 4 and verse 33, and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. <clears throat> The Apostle Paul would eventually tell how he had been given special knowledge of the mystery of Christ, that the Gentiles would, would be fellow heirs in the body of Christ. And then he says this in the book of Ephesians, chapter 3 and verse 7. Wherefore, I was made a minister, minister of, this, of this mystery according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his 
power. Webster defines effectual as having adequate power or force to produce the desired or the intended effect. It is efficient, active power that gave him the gift of grace to be able to minister the preaching of the gospel. That is the enabling, that is the power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus promised would come. He expresses a similar thought in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 5. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power, in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, <clears throat> as you know, what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And so, did you hand me my bottle of water, please? I forgot to bring it up. <clears throat> Thank you. Excuse me. Feeling a little froggy, croaking. Sorry about that. As we have opportunity to, for, to witness for Christ under any circumstance, we too can pray. We too can claim Jesus' promise of power to enable us to be effective witnesses for Jesus. That's what Jesus was promising. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be able to be witnesses because he is going to enable you, he is going to empower you to do it. And the disciples gave us an illustration that we can ask for that to happen. But what about the other effects of power that I spoke of earlier, the signs and wonders that was, were done? Does the promise of Jesus include those for us too? Well, God is certainly not limited by time as to what he can accomplish within his will. God can do whatever he wants through his people whenever he wants. However, I do not believe those powers are the same for us today, which I acknowledge is not the same as what some people believe. I do believe, however, in the power of prayer. And I do believe that God, and I know that God has done some miraculous things as a result of prayers, of, excuse me, of faith. Now why do I not believe those signs and wonders as done by men in the early church are not for today? And I come across that because of a verse in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12, which says this. Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. They were signs of the apostles. Now, not all of the signs and the, the wonders that were done were done by apostles. Peter, excuse me. Uh, Philip and Stephen were not apostles, but they were done during the times of the apostles. And so according to Paul, the signs and the wonders were related to the apostles and their time period. So I believe that when the twelve apostles and Paul died, that the signs and wonders died with them, that were done in the same way as the time that they did them. So, does that mean there's no other power available to us other than for witnessing? No, absolutely not. There is power given to us by the Holy Spirit to live godly lives unto Jesus and for Jesus. Now, we're breaking into another thought here, but Paul says this in the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verses 26 to 29. He was made a minister to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which had been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest unto his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Now listen to this. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. Now notice that Paul was saying that he is laboring and striving. 
Labor here is to work until weary, until fainting from exhaustion. And striving is what athletes do as they strain every muscle in them to get to the prize, the goal at the end of the race. You say, well, that doesn't sound much like being empowered to me if you've got to labor and work that hard. But notice what Paul says. It's not that our life is going to be effortless. We still are to work hard at living for God, but we work that hard, Paul said, and according to or in agreement with and depending on his working, which works in us mightily. That laboring and that striving that he was doing, he was doing being empowered by the Holy Spirit to accomplish it. That's his enablement. Now how we appropriate that power is going to be coming out in future messages in this series as well. So why talk about these truths that we've covered today? Well, first of all, to clarify what is meant by the baptism of the Holy Spirit in light of the confusion that is being taught on the subject today. Secondly, to help us understand what the power is that Jesus promised would come to us when we receive the Holy Spirit when we got saved. But there's one final application here that I want us to think about. Jesus declared that they would positively be witnesses for him in Jerusalem and eventually into the uttermost parts of the world. That was a statement. You will be witnesses. But what kind of witnesses they would be could be a possibly a negative witness or a positive witness. It could go either way. If a person who is a believer in Jesus does not live a godly life, does not live a life of a positive testimony for Christ, they are going to be a witness for Jesus. But people are going to see a witness about Jesus that they are not going to look at in a positive light. And when I come and I come to them and I say, I want to share with you some things about Jesus, and they look at me and they say, what? You don't live like a Christian. Why should I listen to you? That's being a witness about Jesus that is not what he is looking for. Jesus is looking for a positive witness. He's looking for people who are going to go out and share the truth of the gospel out of a life of walking with him, living for him. And as we do that, we shall be positive testimonies, positive witnesses about him, and he will enable us to declare the truth about who he is and what he has done for people and the promise says we will be enabled and empowered to share that truth to others. So the question this I want to ask you this morning, I want us to ask ourselves this morning is this, what kind of a witness am I to those who are around me? Am I living in such a way that if I come to a point where I have an opportunity to declare to them the truth of the gospel, present the truth of the gospel, will they listen to me or will they reject the truth because they are not seeing a positive witness in my life? Let's pray. Father, this morning I thank you for the truths that we've looked at. And Lord, we have looked at some truths in a in a hurry in a sense this morning because there's so much that could be said about each one of these truths that we've looked at but lord as we think about being empowered by the holy spirit i pray that we might realize the fact that we need to be living lives that are faithful to the, your word faithful to life in christ so that we can be empowered to be testimonies to Jesus and people will listen and want to know maybe even more about him because we are living that kind of a life. And so, Father, I just pray that you might work in us to be mindful of how we live and to be mindful of how we work and walk in relation to the Holy Spirit as we're going to see in the weeks to come. For we pray in Jesus' name because only he is worthy. Amen. In your bulletin, 
is an insert of a song that um, we learned here a few weeks ago. And I thought it would be good to repeat it again because of its exalting the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it would also help you to be able to get more familiar with it. So be thou exalted. Let's stand together, please, as we sing in closing. Sing just the third verse to speak in the Holy Spirit. Be the